Video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. Let me introduce myself. My name is Wen Netherland. I'm with uh, Squeegee. We're a Ruby consultancy uh, in Texas. We're in Dallas, Houston, Austin. We've got one guy in China, at least for the next two weeks. He's been over there all summer, so I think he's ready to come home. Uh, and this is JavaScript and Ruby frameworks. Let's see if this, hopefully uh, nobody else is, we have, have the Macs are getting uh, hijacked by the remote here in the front row, because I know a dude doesn't like three machines at the house. Uh, <laughs> switch over. Alrighty, let's get it started. So, as you'd expect, we're going to talk about Ruby frameworks and JavaScript frameworks from the panel discussion. So being a Ruby conference instead of a Rails conference, it's kind of passe to spend a whole lot of time on, on Rails. So uh, there's also Merb out there, which is an upcoming, uh, they call it the Pocket uh, Rocket Framework. Uh, there's Camping and Sinatra, which are geared towards uh, micro apps, much simpler applications than what you would normally build with uh, Rails or Merb. On the JavaScript side, most people know about Prototype and Scriptaculous because uh, they're integrated with Rails. Um, so if you are uh, using Ruby, chances are you know Prototype and Scriptaculous already. jQuery is another one that is uh, very popular, <coughs> especially among the, the Ruby crowd based on its syntax. Um, but I hope to um, expose you to a couple of uh, frameworks that you may not have heard of, MooTools, YUI, and XJS. And the plan was to, to talk through uh, each of these frameworks. And uh, the logical outcome of the, of the talk would be to talk about MERB and, and jQuery, which is um, back in May when I pitched the talk what I uh, had planned on talking about until I actually read some of the panel uh, descriptions for the other speakers. So I suppose this is a kind of a slight problem to um, my talk today and raises some serious questions. <laughs> so a brief search of Mr. Katz on the, on the web. Not all these results are relevant. <laughs> Did uncover a portal. That recent photo. And then this one for the Houston and Austin crowd. <laughs> but evidently, Mr. Katz actually wrote the book on jQuery, literally, um, which doesn't mean a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> But a little further digging, uh, turn up Mr. Katz's um, GitHub profile. And to my amazement, he's uh, done quite a lot in both communities. He's a Merb core developer, a jQuery committer, um, heavy in the data mapper project. He's kind of a big deal. <laughs> so in deference to Mr. Katz, if you want to hear a Merb jQuery talk, 10 AM tomorrow would be uh, the time and place to do that. And be sure and catch both books. So what do you want to do in the next 30 minutes? <laughs> so you may be asking, uh, why JavaScript at a Ruby conference? And I think the, to, uh, it's encouraging to see the reason uh, the first question that we asked, uh, how many guys are doing you know, web-facing Ruby work? And the answer is quite a few. Um, and so it's you know, the ground game in our uh, web application development. And the stronger JavaScript developers we are, the better web application we create. So why JavaScript frameworks then? Sorry. That should be why JavaScript frameworks. Something totally different. To abstract browser quirks, so no more checking the index, user agent, uh, MSIE, Mozilla, to try to figure out what to serve up to a particular browser. To extend the language, add things to the native types that aren't there by default. 
Ajaxify certain things. You can't have a Web 2.0 application without Ajax. So uh, these frameworks normally supply some sort of uh, Ajax plumbing. <coughs> Uh, to bring sanity to events, um, the event model of, of certain browsers historically in JavaScript has been a problem. This uh, problem is, has been solved somewhat by the way that frameworks uh, wrap up the way you handle events in JavaScript. And of course, effects. It wouldn't be a proper JavaScript framework without providing some sort of effects. So the lineup. Prototype is probably the most popular of the ones that are out there, um, especially in the Ruby crowd since it does ship with Rails. And you can't really talk about prototype without talking about Scriptaculous because it's the, uh, the paint job. So prototype uh, integrated with Rails, as we mentioned, uh, provides several OOP enhancements to JavaScript itself to make uh, dealing with objects and object-based programming in JavaScript a little easier. Um, has a myriad of utility functions. I try these, and then the wrapper functions for the uh, dollar, dollar, dollar um, methods, dealing with forms, the dollar F, and arrays with the dollar A method. And it includes um, very robust AJAX support. A lot of folks that um, started writing AJAX in JavaScript, it was through Prototype and, and some of the, the uh, simplifications that it it created around doing Ajax. And pair it with Scriptaculous, we get the effects. Appear, fade, and puff, and all those nice demos that are on the Scriptaculous website. Drag and drop is a big one to add more interactivity to your JavaScript application, to be able to uh, drag elements around on the page and drop them and get some sort of uh, event handling and feedback of uh, uh, events that mirror desktop applications. Builder is one that is probably underutilized. Um, in building JavaScript applications, it allows you to construct DOM objects and markup in the browser directly um, in an uh, API fashion without having to use string concatenation. jQuery is another popular one. We'll hit this one really fast since Yehud is doing it tomorrow. I didn't get into jQuery right off the, the bat just because of, I think the name <laughs> more than anything else, just the uh, maybe it's bad marketing, but uh, it was quite popular before I, I caught on the bandwagon. But once I noticed the syntax differences in jQuery, it's, it's been uh, a joy to program in jQuery. If, and if you've done it yourself, you probably would agree. It's all based on syntax chaining so that uh, you find yourself dropping into loops less, and you can do the same action uh, on uh, items within a, in a collection just by daisy chaining the, uh, the method calls. jQuery has a lot more uh, simpler support for AJAX in certain cases. You can still drop down and do all of the things that you can do in the other frameworks uh, with the, the AJAX uh, object itself. But the load method in jQuery is, makes it not that simple to do simple loading of external content into a div object. And one of the coolest things that I like about it is the second argument in the load is a CSS selector. So um, you don't have to have necessarily an action that returns uh, markup from an AJAX request that is sans layout and just um, a fragment only. By pro providing that CSS selector, it will take the output of the server response and uh, query it via CSS selector to take just the chunk that you want to load into another object, which is pretty cool. Uh, core effects built in, the same fade, puff, blinds for the most part. And it's not a one-to-one -one correlation with, with prototype, but you'll get a lot of the same types of effects. Another cool feature is the animate method. Uh, anybody here played with animate extensively? Uh, if you haven't, checked it out. It's a cool way to morph and tween between um, end states so that if you want to fade something out, you simply just call animate and provide the end state you want to uh, fade the opacity or other CSS selector. Uh, too, and it handles all the incremental steps in between. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's designed from the ground up uh, for plugins. One of the problems with writing good JavaScript is namespace collision and global variable collision and things of that sort. So one cool feature of jQuery is the fact that you can write a plugin and be reasonably uh, secure in that your code's not going to collide with someone else's. 
And it plays well with others just from a um, selector standpoint. So by default, jQuery you know, uses the dollar selector just like Prototype, Moo, and these other frameworks. But the cool thing about jQuery, and this may be coming to some of the other frameworks just because it is so cool, is that you can change that default selector, in this case, create it to, um, as dollar $J instead of dollar, so that if you want jQuery to play side by side with one of your other frameworks, it can do that pretty easily. And did I mention Yehuda's here? New Tools is another one. Uh, provides also language enhancements around uh, array, hash, number, some things of that sort. Uh, it has OOP extensions via class and class extras. Um, its effects are also built into the core engine in the effects namespace. And it has a lot of the same ones you would find in some of the other libraries. Again, Ajax. Um, the reason I throw this one out there, who here has either heard of or played with Moo? Cool, about what I expected. Um, the cool thing about Moo is, for some reason, it, the designer types have really infiltrated this community. So it seems like every thing that this particular community does is just pure eye candy and, and looks good. So if, uh, if you like great design, then this is a, a framework to check out. Yahoo user interface, anybody played with UE at all? This one's a bit heavier. Um, it is more than just a JavaScript framework. It includes some CSS reset tools and UI patterns and some other things um, in the, uh, the whole package, more than just the JavaScript enhancements. What's cool about uh, Yahoo, in addition to some of the other features it shares with some of the other frameworks, is its namespaces and that it um, really is architected um, to play nice with other frameworks and not get in the way, just much like the, the jQuery no conflict mode. But something about this code I find very verbose and Java-esque. <laughs> um, it reminds me back um, before I made the switch off of Microsoft when it seems they ported the CLR down to the, uh, the uh, what is the, the marketing buzzword for the AJAX, their AJAX package, but they essentially took the whole uh, common language runtime and, and ported it to JavaScript. And that same syntax reminds me of that, that framework. XJS, anyone heard of this one? Cool, a lot of folks, and probably doing data, tables and grids and things. Um, this particular one is uh, it's more widget-based. They do have some language enhancements. Um, this one is very, uh, it's a very good fit if you're using a lot of uh, data manipulation, especially with client-side sorting grids and things, because their grid um, and layout on the, and the client is, is spectacular. Uh, Great-looking grids, um, they're, really themed like Windows control, so it's for applications that really need to, to mirror or uh, take a stab at recreating a desktop experience in the browser. And we'll get to more on those UA components in just a second. So the big question at a Ruby conference is how do all of these play with, with Ruby? And there's a few approaches to including JavaScript code in your, in your Ruby projects. The first one is, is helpers, this is the one that uh, if you're into Rails, you're into Merb, is the usual approach. A lot of folks have the, uh, the outlook that you really don't want to touch JavaScript directly, especially if you're a Rubyist, uh, unless you're comfortable in the front end. I just I meet a lot of middle tier developers that are very um, data savvy, very object oriented, and um, consider JavaScript the ugly residue that gets on your web applications. So a lot of folks, you have the, the, the mindset that you don't want to handle the JavaScript directly, and so you use a helper. And this is good because it provides you know, a clean way to, um, in a dry way, call JavaScript from your Ruby view code. Uh, it avoids tag soup, so, you know, and, and one of the challenges with ERB is that we've got HTML markup intermingled with our Ruby code already, add a third language of that, and it becomes even more complex. So Ruby helpers are a way to do that, so instead of calling the uh, Ajax object directly from prototype. You just use the link to remote. Nice, dry uh, method of including Ajax in your application. There's a dark side of helpers. You've got to keep an eye on them, especially when they turn on you. I don't know if you can see that. That's doc ock. So consider this dry view code, and it may be hard to see. I didn't anticipate the, uh, the contrast 
with the, uh, the monitor, I mean the uh, projector. But this is a nice dry piece of code that renders a table and for every row in the record set we're going to have an AJAX link up to um, an AJAX call that does a, a destroy on that particular row in the database. So really easy to, to put it in a loop, put your link to remote, off you go, really, really dry, right? But it's very wet and sloppy in the browser. If you notice the highlighted areas, we're including the same inline AJAX call for every row in the database. And you'll see that your page size grows substantially just because you're repeating the same code over and over again. So if you have 100 rows in your, in your table, you get the exact same code 100 times over. And the only thing that <coughs> changes is the user ID that you're passing into the, to the remote function call. So how do we fix this? One method is unobtrusive JavaScript. Anybody familiar with UJS? Cool, a few hands. It's uh, gaining some steam. Um, there's some upsides and downsides to, to UJS. This is one of the upsides. And it, it just promotes good front end practice in the first place. Focus on your markup, write good semantic markup. In this case, we just render the table um, with an inline link. And now, one change that, that I did over the example um, of the article outlining this was this actually links up to a confirm delete action. Uh, it's a standard web page that it links to. You'll see a lot of um, links to an AJAX call to destroy something. You have to confirm the JavaScript in there and it will intercept the call and keep uh, from having get requests that, that do something destructive in the database. But most of the time I see this particular piece of code executed that href would just be a hash or a pound sign, and then they'll intercept it and, and make the AJAX call on the back end. Uh, the problem with that is if you don't have JavaScript in, enabled, you know, the, the page doesn't do anything anyway. So I found when doing UJS, it just helps to architect the application like JavaScript was not in play, build your methods and your actions and controllers to perform the work that you were going to perform if JavaScript wasn't enabled, and then just hijack that after the fact. And this is a prototype example to listen in on each of those links in the table and pass it off to the same AJAX request to do the destroy. Um, but the cool thing about this is it's over in a JavaScript file and our markup that's sent to the browser is much leaner because the function is written once, we're not writing it in line every time. Tools to do UJS, uh, jQuery supports it out of the box. It, it actually, um, it's almost designed for it and it's support for CSS3 selectors. So if one of the first tools that, that you need to write UJS is just to learn the CSS3 selectors <coughs> because you'll find yourself looping through uh, collections less and less if you just start with a more specific selector that can find the, the element that you're wanting out of the box. Um, so jQuery is a, a tool that can do this. Dan Webb's Low Pro. Anybody use Low Pro? Cool. I keep asking the questions. I'm finding my kindred brother in here that I'm going to uh, talk to you after the talk. Uh, Low Pro is an object oriented kind of attachment to a uh, prototype that allows easy attachment and detachment of behaviors to particular elements on the page, and they can even uh, inherit from one another. So you can define a behavior. Uh, i give you a, a good example from the, the defaults for Low Pro. He defines a remote object that's a base class that handles either remote link or remote form. And there's subclasses of that, remote link and remote form, that you can attach to uh, an anchor tag or a form tag. And it is smart enough to look at the href for, it, for the anchor or the action for the form and do what you would want to do 90% of the time, and that's called the same action behind the scenes and render an update or uh, some other action on success. LowPro has also been ported to jQuery. Um, when Dan came out with it, he kind of floated the, the idea of LowPro for, for jQuery first and to, just to see if there were any takers. And ended up doing it almost solely for the class.create um, enhancement that is already in prototype. So it brings kind of OOP um, enhancements to jQuery to be able to create these behaviors and have them inherit from each other. And there's also UJS for Rails. 
I'm not sure if this is still active. The website looks like it's been abandoned. It's been, uh, I think, early 2007 since the last time this has been uh, active. But there is a plugin that will help um, modify some of the helpers in Rails and provide new helpers in Rails to do a lot of the uh, JavaScript that you would normally do in a UJS manner. Another approach uh, is widgets. So we all have application pieces of um, functionality that we really need to componentize at the UI level. Uh, I use the, the term widgets. You can use controls, components, gadgets, whatever you want to call them. And they're just a way to have a programmatic API interface to a, a GUI control, much like you would have in a, in a desktop application. There's a number of ways to do this, but this is kind of a catch-all term for a reusable chunk of UI code. And the normal things that, that applications um, need that we tend to reuse over and over again are grids, tabs, date pickers, things of that sort. And each of the frameworks that we've talked about has some sort of support for it out of the box. jQuery is the jQuery UI project, which is pretty cool if you haven't checked it out. It's um, recently been revved. It has a whole theme roller application that you can go to on the website and define your own themes with very sophisticated uh, op opacity, translucent settings, base colors, where really you can define your own skin for the, all the controls that, that ship with uh, the jQuery UI project. Plugins.jQuery.com is another one where not everything on the jQuery plugin site is uh, UI. Um, has a UI, sometimes it's, it's just base JavaScript functionality, but there's a lot of them on that website. LivePipe is one for prototype. Um, it's not, uh, it, it's a commercial project, but it also um, has a, a free version that um, provides a lot of these pieces of functionality out of the box, like tabs and, and uh, grids and things. Scriptique is another one, especially if you're using Rails or <coughs> Prototype especially. Uh, it's a vast index of UI components and extensions. And like we mentioned before, both YUI and XJS include a lot of these out of the box. And the fourth approach is MVC in the browser. So we've all used MVC in either Merb or, or Rails, most likely. We know the, and even Camping and Sinatra um, support the MVC pattern. So there's great benefits in keeping your code in particular buckets around whether it's data or uh, behavior or rendering uh, that data in particular context. So MVC in the browser may sound like a crazy idea. The, um, but it's just so crazy it just might work. Anybody here heard of Sprout Core? Cool. Two or three hands. So Sprout Core is um, JavaScript based. If you're at home in Ruby, you'll be at home in, in uh, Sprout Core. It's standard based and it is um, pure JavaScript for the most part. Um, MVC in the browser, as we mentioned, its aim is to provide really uh, slick uh, desktop grade applications in the browser. It powers uh, Apple's mobile me. And so the goal is to have the same interactivity that you would have in the browser cross platform that you would have uh, in a particular Cocoa application. And you'll see in a demo in just a second how it uh, resembles Cocoa. So why do you care about this as a Rubyist? Well, it has a lot of Ruby flavor in it, to tell you the truth. The syntax is straight out of Ruby. You'll see some of the view code in just a second. That is, looks just like ERB. So it's got the same hash rocket syntax that, that you're familiar with and comfortable with. It's got generators. So um, the MERB-based development environment includes generators to generate models, views, controllers. Um, the output is JavaScript files, but they uh, very closely mirror what you're used to using in either MERB or in Rails. It includes fixtures, and I put that exclamation in, in uh, parentheses, depending on your view of fixtures. They've got a bad rap uh, recently. But if you're in development mode in a Sprout Core application, uh, you can uh, create fixtures, and those fixtures are loaded when your application loads, so it makes testing a lot easier. So let me pull up a brief demo real quick. Alrighty, 
see if I can drive backwards here. This is a sample from Sprout Core, the GUI controls sample application that ships with it. So to give you a little background on what I'm doing here, let me get my terminal window on the other, other screen. This code's up on GitHub, so you just git clone it as you would any other project. And it should look very familiar to you to just run SE server. It looks just like script server. And it's cranking up Merb in the background. And so this is the development environment for Sprout Core. So all of the generators are powered by Ruby. And then you just navigate to your local address. In this case, their default port's 4020. And I go to the sample controls project. This is an example of a collection. Notice the drag and drop reordering. The GUI is based on data binding, which should be familiar to those guys that have done Coco. So you update the model, your, your views automatically get uh, updated because it employs data binding. It has buttons, tabs, things you would expect to do in a desktop type application. Of course, this won't be a fit for every uh, application that you build, but if you do find yourself designing an application that's very, uh, needs to be very interactive and client heavy, this may be uh, an option to look at. But notice the syntax. Can you guys in the back see that? Same ERB type hash rocket syntax to put a slider on the page, radio buttons. Actually, I found it interesting. There's a radio button group that they have that we don't have in, in Rails, which would be quite helpful. Has the notion of scrollable panes, also modal dialogues. And even inline pickers. <coughs> Form validation. So just like you'd expect in server-based Ruby application, you can do form-based validation in JavaScript. So let's look at a Sprout Core project real quick. This is the Photos application. Let me just browse to that and show you what we're going to walk through here in just a second. So it's just a, a slimmed down version of uh, kind of an iPhoto clone. And it'll list all the photos in a particular collection. Notice the menu list over on the left hand side. We can drag and drop and reorder these. We can even add new ones. And drag and drop photos into that collection. And all that's persisted as long as the page has persisted. What's cool about this is there is a controller, their views, their models, just like you'd expect in a, in a uh, server application. What took me a little while to wrap my head around was the fact that all this is happening in one particular client view in a, in a client application. So we're used to, I click a link, I go to another action on a web page in a server-based application. And with um, a JavaScript MVC application, these are simply just click events all on the same page. So they're really not navigation events as much as they are interaction uh, view changing events. So I click a particular button. I'm calling a controller action that is changing data underneath the hood, and then the view gets updated from there, which is pretty cool. And if you've done any sort of desktop development, that should be very uh, comfortable for you. So let's look at a, a model here in the particular photo application. Uh, let's look at probably photo first. It's a little simpler. So to create a new model, it's just photos. Your, this is the name of your application, photos. The name of your model, in this case, photo.sc.record extend. It's kind of like active record base. Should look very familiar to you. And you define your properties directly in line here. Now, properties in a uh, Sprout Core model, you define them, but you don't call them directly. So you have an object. In this case, let's say we had a photo instance of this photo type. We wouldn't say photo.url. We would say photo.get URL and set URL. Um, 
if you're familiar with doing a lot of Java desktop development, this should look familiar to you. And the reason for that is we have to give the framework a chance to react to the gets and the sets so that if we set data, we can fire off um, um, events to observers so that views can be updated. So it makes the um, syntax a little bit more verbose, but it's definitely worth the, uh, the ability to have observers and, and data binding. This is the album record. So notice that we've defined a couple of uh, properties here directly in line. So just like you'd expect in active record, a photo belongs to an album. Album has many photos. So the photos property here is defined in line with photo count, an inline function. And then the property photos is actually what exposes that as a photos property on the album collection. Uh, you can uh, define a property just by inline uh, setting uh, a value. You can also do it in an array with a properties array at the top of the, uh, the record. And the cool thing about Sprout Core applications is they're, they're localized. So your languages are stored in these LProj um, folders. And this is so that the build tools, the MER build tools at design time can go through and localize your uh, application based on the strings that you define. So you just drop another language in here and define your own strings. You can totally localize your user interface, which is pretty cool. I wanted to show you some of the view code. So this is the, the main view that gets loaded this body when I crank up the application. And that should look very familiar to Rubyists out there. But all of this is creating JavaScript on the fly, which is a pretty cool thing. So how do you debug one of these applications? That may be a popular question. Good old firebug. Clear this out. See if I can type behind myself here. So in a controller, there's an SC Sprout Core um, global object. And within that, we have the store. And it may be hard to see the font that small. The store is where all of the currently loaded models for the application are stored. So this is um, kind of a global bucket to put things. We can then call the type, in this case, photo. And then find, uh, let's see. Let's see if I can find the first one here. Whoops, syntax error. I had all of this stored in history. I wouldn't have to do this on the fly, and then we had to reboot the machine right before the demo, so bear with me one second. Actually, let's just look at store. So if we just look at the SC store object, we can inspect it in Firebug and drill through, just like you would expect to do any other object. Uh, the records internal property there shows all the different albums and the photos, and you can drill down to a particular photo and see its properties. So it should look very familiar to you. You've got the same finder uh, methods that you would have in Active Record. You can chain those methods to do uh, you know, photo, photo, once you get a photo object, photo.get, um, and then pass it the album type, and it will fish out the, the album based on the relationship that's set up in the model. I've just started with, uh, with Sprout Core, but it's one of those things that I'm going to take a, a harder look at, um, especially with a couple of applications that uh, would benefit from a, a client uh, heavy application like this that requires a lot of interactivity. Question? Yeah. How, how do you persist the data beyond the page? You'd have to call back to the server, uh, just like you would with any other um, you know, disconnected or uh, rich application uh, framework like you would with Flex or anything else. Uh, one thing I should mention, and I don't have a, a demo or a slide prepared to do it, um, there's a way in your models to set up a server URL that will be used as a resource, kind of like active resource, to go back to the server. And uh, they have some examples in the wiki on GitHub of how to go in and take an action 
let's say in a context controller in the index view that would marshal uh, the special JSON that's needed to return the raw JSON so that this could consume it directly. The big change is um, properties like ID are reserved in JavaScript for obvious reasons. Um, so those get mapped to a GUID property, which is probably a bad name because most people think GUID instead of just the integer, but that's what it gets mapped to. So, and I'm sure we'll see tools that get developed that marshal some of this for, especially in Rails or MERB, um, where you could very easily have a Rails back end. You know, a lot of people are writing applications that uh, error applications have a flex front end to a, a Rails or a MERB back end. I think you'll see the same thing with, with Sprout Core. Yes, sir. Query string after the name. I think that's just to keep it fresh, just like what uh, Rails does, to timestamp to, to force it to reload. A couple more slides, and I'll open up for questions. And this may be hard to see. Again, I didn't anticipate the, um, the contrast on the, on the projector. This is a Sprout Core model. This is the, um, one of the examples on the, on the wiki of a to-do list. Um, essentially, all it does is um, this is the actual to-do object. And this is where the relationship to a to-do list that has many of them belongs to would be set up in that fashion. And you're basically just giving it a type to point back to. In this case, my app is the kind of the namespace, the application namespace in the pr previous um, demo that we just looked at. Photo was the name of the app, so that's why we had photo.photo, .photo, or photo.album in this case is my app.todo list. And so then the other end of that relationship, in this case, to-dos is the collection property um, hanging off the to-do list, so to-dos is the has many relationship that you'd be familiar with in, in Active Record. And here's a look at the fixtures we talked about earlier. As I mentioned, the, the GUID is the ID property. And just like you would expect fixtures in Active Record, you can specify relationships between models, which is pretty cool. And so here's an example of the, the find I was trying to do on the fly with a little success. Um, but that look, should look very familiar to your uh, Active Record finders. So where do you get it? Just sproutcore.com. And then it's up on GitHub at Sprout It. And there's a lot of great wikis that um, I discovered late up on the GitHub. Just click on wikis. And I know a lot of folks don't actually click on the wikis for a lot of GitHub projects because most of them are empty. But this one has a lot of great info in there. And a lot of Rails-specific info um, around what's different between you know, a Rails outlook of, of this type of code, especially the ERB involved. And then how do you hook into a server, um, a Rails server, with some of these model finders and things? So questions? Is Sprout Core based on uh, another library like Prototype? It does use Prototype under the hood for this Ajax calls. Um, so there are, it has a frameworks folder that gets, there, there's a notion of a, a build process with Sprout Core that basically prepares your applications um, for deployment. What gets generated are just standard um, static JavaScript files. Uh, it does use prototype under the hood for a lot of the cross-browser stuff and, and AJAX um, specifically, but there's a frameworks uh, folder that you can drop your own frameworks and, and extend it if you need to, even extend Sprout Core itself. A couple of your examples, you had, um, the, I guess, the server side, all of the markup that was generated. You showed one that was real proposed and the other was less. But uh, is there any uh, difference among the frameworks that would be more um, generating all of the elements locally on the client and just bringing a JSON collection of data down. Uh, jQuery would be more what JavaScript frameworks. So the question was what JavaScript frameworks would be more, um, I guess, agreeable to just passing JSON back from the server and, and having a more client-centric user interface? Well, just sort of the mentality of uh, using the server to grind out record after record after record in the full-blown right. the way it's going to be as opposed to separating transmitting some data, transmitting some functions, and doing everything client-side. You know, none of the frameworks really support that or preclude that more than one or the other. Um, and it's kind of a design decision. If anything, jQuery probably promotes passing JSON back and forth um, a little bit 
Uh, it's just a kind of a, one of their opinions baked into the, to the framework. Although they do really easily support passing HTML fragments back. Um, but the notion of RJS that's kind of built into Rails, where you do a lot of you have the actions that, that if they want JavaScript, you have all these you know, Ruby helpers to write JavaScript in your RJS files. That whole paradigm is kind of it's just not embraced by the jQuery community. Um, as far as the other frameworks, nothing that it really differentiates themselves one way or the other, with the uh, exception of maybe Sprout Core does um, lend itself more towards collections and things on the client instead of on the server. So instead of going to get an HTML fragment and binding it, although you can, it's really, really easy to do, um, they want to provide uh, more tools for doing that data binding on the client so that you get all of the, uh, the same click events and, and things um, on the client side instead of having to always call back and do something on the server. Are any of these uh, working with uh, HTML5 on browser data store? Boy, I thought I had a plant in the, in the audience. It's a great question. Uh, are any of these working uh, with the HTML5 data store? Uh, Sprout Core does. And actually, if you fired up in Firebug, it will tell you, warning, this browser doesn't support H5, HTML5 okay. data store. Um, changes will need to be persisted in the server. So, but that is an option. It's a cool option, too. Okay. All of them do or just Sprout Core? Uh, Sprout Core is the only one that I'm familiar with. Yes? I'm surprised you left Dojo out. <laughs> I, I was, I, see, I leave Dojo out, and then I'm uh, waiting for the guy that asked about Dojo, because we sent it to a, uh, I sent this to my colleague in China, and his very first question is, you didn't mention Dojo. So I did mention the ones that I have a first-hand experience with, and I don't have experience with Dojo. I know I'm, it's been out there for a while, and a lot of people swear by it, but just personally, I haven't used it. Does uh, Sprout Core have a testing story? It does. It does. It does. Testing's built in, much less. I didn't, I didn't go over that, but their uh, tests are generated. Um, or harnesses for them, you know, the, the skeleton test, just like you would an active record model if you generate it and you get a, a test that's, that's spit out so that really encourages, encourages testing from the ground up. So you, you use um, Sprout Core within Ruby or it almost seems like it would be a replacement for it? Well, it depends. There's the well, Rails. there's the uh, there's kind of the split, right? There's the, the client side and there's the server side. Sprout Core itself is server agnostic. You could use it standalone as client only, especially if you had a lot of static content. Um, in this particular case, that I um, was showing with the photos, all those photos are resources in the project, and they're choosing the the file URL to get to them. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that doesn't work on the server, but if you are going to bundle it up and it's ship it with them, you could. Stuff. It could be, but it also could have a server base back in. Back in. What I didn't show is normally in that, that um, photos demonstration, instead of it being looking at a local file system, I'd make a, a call to a photos controller probably in Rails or Merb or PHP or whatever it was, and it comes back with JSON that I then create and marshal objects client side, and then I have the client data to work with. Yes? Are all of these uh, fairly liberal uh, MIT or BSC licenses? It's a good question. Uh, EXJS, uh, I did, I think, put a blurb uh, about that, is dual license. One of the licenses is LGPL3, I believe. And they have a commercial license. So it's probably the stickiest of the licenses. Uh, the rest of them, I believe, are MIT, except for UE, which is BSD, which is a, it's a, it's a very good question. It's something to keep a, a look out for, depending on what your distribution model is. Uh, speaking of distribution, one cool thing I did not mention in the uh, frameworks is a lot of these frameworks now are getting really surgical about what you can, uh, what parts you have to download and install to get them. Uh, you know, we're familiar probably for, uh, most of us with prototypes, uh, drag and drop effects being separate from, from the defaults. And if you just, in your Rails application, JavaScript include defaults, you get all of that uh, for free. Um, prototype is componentized somewhat, but jQuery. Um, especially jQuery UI, not jQuery itself because it's pretty small, but jQuery UI and Moo now on their website when you go to download you basically check the check boxes for the feature support that you want and can get a customized download package of a very slim version that basically has the least common denominator for everything that you need and usually in minified or zipped, gzipped 
uh, file format so you can just pop them on your server. Another uh, interesting thing to keep an eye on is Google over the summer began hosting these frameworks, most of the, the larger frameworks, on their servers as a CDN type model. So it's another option. That way not everybody has to, to host their own JavaScript files. All righty. Well, thanks, guys. Video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.